Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for a virtual outing in Muir Woods. My name is Jesse. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications at Greenbelt Alliance. For those of you who aren't familiar with our work, our mission is to educate, advocate, and collaborate to ensure the Bay Area's lands and communities are resilient to a changing climate. The work we do to protect the Bay Area's natural and agricultural lands, while also in creating thriving neighborhoods, as well as this free outings program is made possible by you. So please donate today, which you can do so securely on our website at greenbelt.org forward slash donate. During the outing, please feel free to ask questions and I can you can use the chat function or the Q&A function, which I will be monitoring. And then at the end of the outing, we will make sure that Ken gets to hopefully all of those questions um, for an engaging session. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Ken, our wonderful audience leader. Um, and I just wanted to uh, let everybody know we've got two more um, virtual outings scheduled at this point for May. On May 8th, we have botanizing San Francisco's urban staircases with Zena Colby Salzman. And then on May 15th, we have Garden of the Jungle Gods. We'll be commemorating Mount Diablo's 100th birthday. But today we're at Muir Woods, where most of us have, have been before, if not on our own, when we have relatives come in, we of course, head off to, to Muir Woods. And just to kind of set the geographic uh, stage, Muir Woods is nestled at the base of Mount Tamalpais. Here it is. And through it runs Redwood Creek out to, uh, out to Big Lagoon, Lagoon and, and then Muir Beach. And here's a, a bit of the jurisdictional map of the, the different parkland. And here's Muir Woods. And then kind of a view of the valley floor. And as you can see there are junior ranger books in the visitor center. Hopefully after today, you know, you'll know enough to earn your little junior ranger sticker. And if not, I'll take the blame. Anyway, so Muir Woods, well, it's preserved as a park today because of the trees, the coast redwoods. And if you look up uh, California official state uh, emblems, uh, objects, you'll see that under trees, it says California redwoods, which is a little odd because there's really no such tree. We have two redwoods. California is the only state in the union that has coast state trees. We're also the only state in the union that has an official state lichen. So I, I guess that goes with that. The tree that we've got uh, at, at Muir Woods and around the Bay Area in, in a few locations is the coast redwood, Sequoia sempervirens. And it's a, a great choice for a coast street a state tree because by species, the coast redwood is the tallest tree on earth. At Muir Woods, the tallest redwood measures out at 260 feet. The tallest we know of currently growing is 379 feet up in Northwestern California. And kind of the theoretical limit, if you're wondering how tall they can possibly grow, it's about 420, 425 feet, the uh, physicists tell us. At that point, the uh, uh, pull of gravity is just too much for the, the water headed up the water column. And there have no doubt been trees that redwoods that tall in the past that are gone now, may have been logged. Up in uh, British Columbia, there was actually a Douglas fir that was 400 and two, 420 feet. Unfortunately, it was on lumber company land and it was logged. The other redwood, the other uh, part of this duet is the giant sequoia, Sequoia dendron giganteum. And that's the tree that grows on the Western slope of the Sierra Nevada mountains. And this one is distinguished. It's distinguishing uh, factor is that it is the thickest tree in the world the largest tree in the world by volume. So here they are, trunk to trunk. And if you have problems remembering which is which, just remember 
your woods has the basketball players and Yosemite has the football players. And notice the little, the little guy over here, the Dawn Redwood. That's actually the, the third of the three musketeers. The Dawn Redwood was thought, was thought to be extinct. It was known only from the fossil record and it was discovered on an expedition to China, to central China, right after World War II and before the communist takeover. So, and the Dawn Redwood is uh, of more modest stature and it's planted around the Bay Area as an ornamental. We see some of those in, on some of Bob Johnson's Berkeley walks. Well, anyway, as you can imagine, every place the coast redwood grows, it dominates the forest being so tall, but it only grows one place in the world now. 20, 30 million years ago, it was widespread across North America. And back in dinosaur times in Mesozoic era, its uh, ancestors were all over the world. But now it grows only one place on the outer coast range of California, close to the, close to the coast from just south of Big Sur, right up to the Oregon border, and actually seven miles into Oregon, so we can't quite claim it as our own. And the reasons it's so restricted have to do with climate. Coast redwoods don't like hot, dry weather, and they don't like ice and snow. So you couldn't uh, buy a little sprout in a Muirwoods gift shop and send it back to a relative in Buffalo, New York, and think it's going to survive over the winter because it won't, may not even survive the summer. The other reason though is that coast redwoods are water spendthrifts. A mature coast redwood transpires one or 200 or even more, one or 200 gallons of water a day through its foliage. And that's a problem. So we all recognize the uh, the redwood spray on the left, that's what we usually associate with the, the coast redwood. But if you visit a, a redwood forest with uh, particularly tall trees after a windstorm or, or heavy rain, you might see this on the ground and you wonder where'd that come from? Well, that's called the sun foliage. That, that's what grows at the very top of, of coast redwoods. And the tiny size of, of the needles of the leaves is designed to reduce water loss and uh, exposure to the sun. So it's trying, it's just not doing a very good job of it. So kind of the, the elephant in the room is, well, I can see, we can see that uh, the coastal range explains the, the temperature, the mild temperatures they require, but gee, here in California, we've got a Mediterranean climate. We get all our rain in just a few months during the late fall and early winter and early spring, and then it doesn't rain all summer. So why aren't these trees dead by August? Well, the trees that grow near creeks, they, they're all right, the, riper, the ones that are riparian, as they got, we've got perennial springs, Redwood Creek is a perennial spring. But how about the trees higher up on the hillside? Come August, they could be in big trouble, but just when they've got their uh, perennial, their uh, backs or their, their trucks up against the wall, in comes the fog. And supposedly Mark Twain said, coldest winter, coldest summer I ever spent. Now cold, coldest winter, it's right there. I could. Coldest winter I've ever spent was one summer in San Francisco. And of course, the reason was the fog. So the fog rolls in, coats the foliage, drips to the ground, and it turns out that fog drip accounts for just an incredible amount of, of uh, water, of precipitation, the equivalent of 20 to 30 inches of rain up in Northwestern California and in uh, Marin area of Muir Woods, anywhere from 10 to 20 inches. And that's enough to keep these trees going and growing until the rain start again in the fall. And it was long suspected that coast redwoods were somehow taking that fog right in through their foliage. 
And trees aren't supposed to do that. And it was kind of a mystery until a few years ago when researchers at the University of California in Berkeley uh, experimented with uh, redwoods that put them in a, a cloud chamber and the chemical fingerprint of fog is different than rain. The water in rain has a larger proportion of heavier isotopes of the atoms of, of the deuterium and hydrogen and oxygen 18. So they could tell the difference. And what the researchers discovered that about 10% of the coast redwoods water intake was from directly through the foliage. They were taking the fog in. Now, just how they were doing that, that was another mystery. And one of the ideas was there was a microscopic fungus living on, in top of the, uh, in the foli on the foliage, on the tops of the trees, and the fungus was sticking the mycelium, their, my their little roots, into the redwood leaves and acting as a water wick to get the water in. In exchange, that fungus was getting sugars from the tree, so a nice little symbiotic relationship. Well, you might think that the tallest tree in the world's got some of the deepest roots. If the trees go up 200, 300 feet, the roots must go down at least that far. If nothing else, that might explain all the earthquakes here we, ha we have here in California. Who needs plate tectonics? We've got the coast redwoods. But the truth is, coast redwood, well, they've got no taproot. And the roots don't go, go down any further than about 10 feet, even on the tallest trees. They don't fall over on us because they do go out. They can go out 50 feet in every direction and they're wrapped around the roots of other trees. So they all prop each other up. If there's a big flood and a layer of silt is deposited that on the ground, that's enough to, to kill many trees but the coast redwoods with those shallow roots are able to grow them back up to the surface, or they can even send out new roots from the, new, from the trunk at the new ground level. So they do a great job in surviving floods. You might think the tallest tree in the world's got some of the biggest cones. You might need a hard hat just to walk through Beerwood safely. But these are the cones from the coast redwood. They're about the size of olives. And these are the female cones, the seed cones. The male cones are even tinier. And in the springtime, the pollen from the male cones on the top of one tree will blow and to the female cones at the bottom of another tree. And if those cones are pollinated and fertilized, the seeds develop. And when they fall, they're the size of grains of rice for the tallest tree in the world. But under normal conditions, those little seeds don't have much of a chance to get started. There's just too much stuff on the forest floor, you know, old needles of duff and, and, uh, and the herbaceous layer. There'd have to be a big fire or a flood to clear everything off and give those seedlings a chance. And well, the last major fire on the floor of Muir Woods was over 200 years ago. I say that and you can see the, the burn scar on this tree and just about every tree in, in Muir Woods has, has evidence of past fire, but they're actually, that's evidence of multiple fires for many centuries past because historically the Native Americans would set fires on Mount Tamalpais to manage the vegetation and occasionally they might burn down to the floor, forest floor. And those low intensity fires, they have very little damage overall. I mean, they cleared off the, the bottom layer for the seedlings. They didn't particularly bother the, the mature trees with the thick bark. But of course today with fire suppression throughout California and the Bay Area, got a problem. When we do get fires in uh, forested areas, they're extremely intense from all that fuel that's built up. They can be crown fires and become very damaging to even the mature trees and anybody who's built a house, any development that was built probably where it shouldn't have been is destroyed. And this is one of the 
areas of concern, of, of emphasis for Greenbelt Alliance with our, our current work. And you can actually go to our website and check out uh, some of our, our, uh, our articles there, including planning principles for managing wild fire risk and new development. And we're also working on a wild fire white paper, which will be available later in the year to help communities plan so we have fire resilient communities. Well, the fact that the, the seeds don't have much chance to get started, well, the Redwoods have a plan. They got a plan B. They're one of the few conifers that can actually reproduce by stump sprouting. Around the root crown of every coast redwood, there's a collar. It's not like our, our shirt collars. It's a collar of bud tissue. And it's usually buried in a healthy tree and healthy environment. You can see that some of that tissue here that's here in Muir, that's in Muir Woods, and there's just been too many people stomping on the on the ground over the over the decades. And there's been a bit of a weathering and erosion, but that's okay. It gives us a chance to see that that crown of bud tissue. So what happens, that tissue is capable of sending out new branches and new limbs. But as long as the tree is healthy, it won't sprout. There's a hormone in the tree that suppresses growth. Occasionally, if the tree gets stressed, you see some of that sprouting going on. You may have a, a redwood in your neighborhood and in your backyard, and sometimes you'll see that, particularly after you've just mowed the lawn. The redwoods don't like that. They're not taking any chances. They're going to start to send, send out those stress shoots just in case but they're not gonna get very tall. As I say, there's a hormone that'll suppress the growth. But if the tree falls down, if it's chopped down, if there's severe damage, well, that hormone stops flowing and all those buds start sprouting. And as you walk through Muir Woods, notice how many trees appear to be growing in giant circles. That's just what's happened. Those are all identical children growing around the root crown of a fallen parent. We call them family circles. And you can imagine what a great advantage that is. You are, a, there's been a disaster in the forest and you get, you get to start from your parents' root crown. So that's a big head start. So they do, one of the reasons they've survived all these millennia. Occasionally, you'll see some of that uh, bud tissue growing higher up in the tree. It looks kind of strange, but it does no damage to the tree. Those are burls. And you know you can regard them as benign tumors on the tree. Nothing's gonna happen unless the tree falls down and then they'll sprout. But notice, wherever you see a tree in a family circle and one of the trees have burls, they all have burls. Remember, they're all clones of themselves, of each other, and of the, of the parent tree. Occasionally, you might even see this, an albino redwood. How can that be? How could there, no chlorophyll. How can a tree survive with no chlorophyll? Well, remember, these are, it's grown off the common uh, root crown of, of a fallen parent. And there's a genetic defect in this particular little shoot. It can't produce chlorophyll. With another tree, that tree would die. But this one, remember, it gets to start off, it gets to share. So it's a little, actually a parasite on its uh, relatives along, around that family, around that family circle. So we've all got one of those in the family, huh? Anyway, they don't tend to get very large and they don't live very long, but Every once in a while, you'll see one of these albino redwoods. Well, sempervirens means always flourishing or always green. And always is the oper operative word there. The average age of coast redwoods, of the coast redwoods and muir woods, thought to be between 400 and 800 years old. The oldest trees down at Cathedral Grove. They're over a thousand years old. The oldest coast redwood on record was 2,200 years old. 
Unfortunately, again, that was on lumber company land and they found out by counting the rings after it had been chopped down. And the secret of their long life, the, the fountain of youth, the, the elixir, it's in the bottle here and it's not Coca-Cola despite the color, it's tannic acid. Crystalline tannic acid is in the redwoods, the coast redwoods, that's what gives them the red color. And it turns out that tannic acid is very bitter. It's so bitter that most insects that bother trees, they won't bother redwoods. The molecular, the chemical structure is such that fungus and uh, other animals won't, and animals won't eat redwood foliage as it, uh, the tannic acid interfer interferes with metabolic processes with digestion. So nobody, redwoods are, are pretty impervious to insect attack, to fungus attack, uh, to, to grazing by herbivores. So, and even, and even our forest floor vacuum cleaner, the banana slug, they eat everything, but they won't touch the redwoods. Nobody dines at the Redwood Cafe. So they go on living for hundreds and hundreds of years. And the tannic acid doesn't burn very easily. And redwood bark is thick and, and fibrous. They used to call it, uh, they used to call it the um, asbestos tree back when asbestos didn't have such a bad reputation. But it does a very good job surviving fire. And even when a fire succeeds in, in burning through one side of the redwood, as long as part of the, the Cambrian layer on the other so side is protected by that thick bark, the tree goes on living. So many of the trees in Muir Woods and in the old growth redwood forest, they got holes right into the center of the tree, but they're still alive. Now, obviously that's not an ideal situation because you, heartwood is gone. And you need that to, to prop up the tree. That's the, the backbone of the tree. So although this tree's still alive, its days are numbered. But when you say that about coast redwoods, you're talking about centuries. So I'm guessing this tree's gonna outlive all of us, even though it's lost its innards. And then down in Bohemian Grove, on the valley floor, there's actually one you can walk right into and get your picture taken. The settlers used to call those holes in the trees goose pens, because supposedly they would uh, put their barnyard fowl in those in the trees with some fencing on the outside. Goose pens. Well, let's head on down to Cathedral Grove and, and take a look at some of the oldest trees in the forest. In uh, 1945, delegates from around the world met in San Francisco to draw up the charter for the United Nations. This was in May. Um, the war in Europe was over, a few months left for the war in the Pacific. And the United States, and of course, the Franklin Roosevelt, one of his uh, pet projects was uh, establishing a United Nations to try to ensure that no such conflicts would occur again. Well, after all the delegates had uh, completed their work in San Francisco with the charter, they came over to Muir Woods and they tromped down to Cathedral Grove. I think that was probably the opposite word, uh, the operative word. And they had a ceremony to commemorate what they had just done and to honor President Roosevelt, who of course died in a month before in April 1945. And you can visit that spot in Cathedral Grove. There's a little plaque there to uh, President Roosevelt. Well, so just what are the characteristics of an, of an old growth forest? What are the uh, qualities that make them special? I mean, at the original 2 million acres of old growth redwoods we had in California, less than 5% are left. And Muir Woods is the only old growth redwood forest in the immediate Bay Area. So really, we won't spend much time on them, just enough to, to complete your Muir Woods Junior Ranger book. But four characteristics 
one large live trees. So we're talking several hundred years old. By contrast, many of us, we do uh, Greenbelt Alliance walks in uh, Redwood Regional Park in Oakland. Those trees are about 115 years old. They've been logged twice and they're no nowhere near the statue, uh, stature of the ones at, at Muir Woods. An old growth forest has time to develop a multi-layered structure. Not only are there those very large trees, there's an understory of, of shorter trees that are home to many uh, types of, of critters. And there's, a, a under, then there's an herbaceous layer on the floor, a thick layer of, of, uh, of uh, living and dead plants on, on the forest floor. And dead trees, both, both standing and fallen, the standing trees are home to many types of birds and other wildlife and those trees that are on the now horizontal, well, they become nursery logs. Soil can build up on the trees over the years and we actually see bay trees and huckleberries sprouting from fallen redwoods. And all these dependent, all these communities are, are dependent upon each other one way or another. And one of the most familiar uh, denizens of this redwood old growth community, of course, is our banana slug, the largest North American mollusk. And four tentacles, those top two have the little eyeballs at the end. They're not much good for anything. The really important ones are the lower ones, the feelers. They do have teeth. Banana slugs have a radula, thousands of rotating teeth. And if you should, if you pick one up with very clean hands to from the rest to rescue it from being tromped on, on on the trail and place it in a safe area, sometimes if you've got a biter, you can feel it. It kind of tickles. But if you have particularly sensitive skin, it can actually leave a little mark. Banana slug hickey, and good luck explaining that one. The little hole there, that's called the pneumostome. They have one lung, and that's the air hole, and they do some other bodily functions through there we won't get into today. Banana slugs are hermaphrodites, both male and female on the same animal, and that makes a lot of sense. You know, they don't move that fast. And you meet another slug, you're good to go. You know, it's kind of uh, speed dating there. And that's about the only thing they do quickly. And of course, the big thing about banana slugs is the mucus. They have several, produce several types of mucus. One allows them to crawl over rough surfaces without being injured. Another mucus helps keep them from being, become desiccated when it's dry. And still another mucus is very sticky and distasteful. Well, not that any of them taste very good, but it makes it very difficult to eat a banana slug. It tends to glue your mouth closed. But the only critter in the area that can handle that are Pacific giant salamanders. And of course we all know very good luck to kiss a banana slug. And I think, well, if you've been to summer camp, that's in Marin, that's what you have to do. I think that whole thing was a conspiracy by outdoor education teachers. When the, cl when the class got too rambunctious, all the kids had to kiss a banana slug, kind of glued their mouth closed for a while. But Marsha here mentioned that where that slug was on her hand became very cold after a, a few seconds. That's because the mucus, some of the banana slug mucus has a very mild neurotoxin. Not enough to hurt you, but you can feel your hand going cold. And at one, at some time ago, that was actually used as, in, in, as a, a part of the base in uh, skin creams and skin lotions. It tightens your skin. It's like Botox. So if you wanna, Stay young looking, just have banana slugs crawl all over you. At least that was Marsha's message. 
And of course, banana slugs have become a part of our local culture, being uh, adopted by UC Santa Cruz as their mascot. And then banana slugs broke into the movies in uh, the 1970s, although I don't believe any actually lived on in Hollywood. Yeah. Too bad they weren't one of the good guys, but they were in there. One of the most uh, common plants in Muir Woods underneath the redwoods is the redwood sorrel, Oxalis oregana. This is a relative of that Bermuda buttercup we all try to get out of our gardens. That's not native, but this is. And redwood sorrel is able to tolerate the shade of a redwood forest and the acidic soil. In fact, it so loves the shade that on those rare occasions when beams of sunlight make it through, they actually fold up like little parasols. They lose their turgor and they, they wait for the shade to return and then they'll open up again. So here's a, a little parasol, little umbrella that closes when it gets sunny, when it uh, gets sunny and then opens up again in the shade. Well, another very noticeable plant is, is horsetail or equisetum. And here's one plant, I like it because it's even more ancient than the redwoods. The lineage for the horsetail goes back 200 million years. And back then they were 50 to 75 feet tall, just a, a few feet today at most. And there's two or three different um, species in the Bay Area here at Muir Woods. We've had the kind that produce from spores rather than just from the, the underground rhizomes. So these are the, the more uh, distinctive uh, branches. These are the vegetative. And every so often you'll see the, the fertile branches going up. These are the spores. One of the interesting characteristics of horsetail is that they pick up silica from the soil. So if you gently rub your fingers on the horse tail, you'll feel how gritty it is. And that characteristic was used to advantage by miners in the 1850s in the Sierra foothills. Well, the, the gold prospectors, they would use horse tail to scrub out their pots and pans, a 19th century Brillo pad, if you will. So another name for horse tail is scouring rush. Redwood Creek is home to a couple of species of salmon, both coho and steelhead. And Oncorhynchus is the species name. And the steelhead are, are born in the Redwood Creek and they spend most of their first year there and then swim back out to the ocean when the rains come. And they can come back to Redwood Creek to spawn every year for several years after their time in the ocean. So they go back and forth. The coho salmon, on the other hand, after their first year in the creek, they'll swim out to the ocean. They'll spend their lifetime out in the ocean, their few years out there. And then they'll swim back up Redwood Creek at the end of their lives to spawn, and that's where they die. So the steelhead can come up multiple times and the coho just once. And of course, landlocked steelhead, they're rainbow trout. If they're never able to make it to the ocean, they can live their whole lives in, in fresh water. Well, these poor fish have a number of problems, not just in Muir Woods, but um, throughout Northern California. And one we've read about recently is just um, substances, material wash, washing off roads into the creeks, making it difficult for the fish. But the big thing for the ones at Muir Woods was, well, these are ana anadromous fish, spending some of their lives in fresh water, some in salt water. And when they make that transition to, from fresh to salt and from salt to fresh, they gotta have time to get the kidney switched over. When you're out there in the ocean, you're trying to get rid of the salt. But when you're in fresh water, you're trying to retain the salt and get rid of the excess water. So they need a place to kind of uh, get everything switched over and ready for whichever way they're going. 
And in the case of the fish going up Redwood Creek to Muir Woods, that was Big Lagoon just before you get to, to Muir Beach. That's brackish water. It's a mixture of the two. But over the years, Big Lagoon had, been, had become uh, somewhat compromised and degraded. So it's becoming a problem. And just a few years ago, the Park Service undertook a big project to rehabilitate Big Lagoon. And they did a great job and they also fixed up the parking lot so it no longer drained into the creek. So on that count, the fish are doing fine. This needs some rain now so it can make it all the way up to Muir Woods. On, on years like this one where there is not much rain, they, they will do, nest and spawn further down in Redwood Creek before they get to Muir Woods. Well, one of the most noticeable birds in the woods is, is this little guy. I learned it as the winter wren, but it's been split off in recent years. The, Eastern, the winter wren now is the Eastern version. We have the Pacific wren. And the great thing about these birds is their call. It's kind of the, the spring sound of Muir Woods. beautiful penetrating call. But the puzzling thing is these birds are insect eaters. Why in the world would they come to Muir Woods where there's few insects because that tannic acid in the tree discourages bugs? Well, these birds come in at the time of their arrival to the spawning of the fish, the salmon. But when those coho salmon die, the flies come in to eat them. And guess who eats the flies? Yeah. And of course, the fish that uh, decayed, that aren't gobbled up by raccoons or the flies, they decay and return nitrogen to the soil for the tree. So, another uh, interesting bird, of course, spotted owl, kind of associated with old growth forests. And as I mentioned, not much of that left. 5% of or less of the original 2 million acres. So these poor birds are hanging on. They were an endangered species, but the prior president uh, had them delisted. And we're hoping that it gets relisted as an endangered species. Um, they were, historically, there was at least one pair nesting in Muir Woods. I haven't been there for, for quite a while. I don't know if that's still the case. The big problem that this bird is facing besides loss of habitat is competition from this guy, the barred owl. Here's the spotted owl, the little spots. The barred owl has the kind of the vertical bars. These guys are bigger, the barred owls, they're more aggressive and they're not shy of people. Now they made it to the west coast on their own. There were native to the east, I mean, probably uh, human alterations to the landscape might have helped them, but they're here. And when they arrive, they drive out the spotted owls. And there was some evidence that they would drive out the males and sometimes the barred owls would actually mate with the spotted owl females, in which case you got a very strange hybrid known as a sparred owl. So it's real, Quandary, um, you know, the, the park people, the nature people uh, are trying to figure out what to do. What do you do about a, a bird that made it on its own but is uh, wreaking havoc on the native population of, of what ought to be an endangered species of owl? The most endearing thing about the barred owl is its call. And who cooks for you? Now that's good enough to do again. Just twice. Well, so redwoods have done a great job in surviving all the forces of nature, of fires and floods and banana slugs, but they've had a lot harder time with people. 
1848, of course, gold was discovered in California. It set off the gold rush. And in the next couple of decades, tens and hundreds of thousands of people came to California. And Redwood, Coast Redwood being such a, so impervious to rot and resistant to fire, it's a great building material. And every single Redwood forest in the Bay Area was logged to build San Francisco and Oakland and San Jose. The only forest that was spared was the one in Redwood Canyon, today's Muir Woods. And that wasn't through any conservation effort, it just turned out that was the luck of geography. Um, Redwood Canyon was too difficult to get to. And even if you could get in there and cut the trees down, you couldn't get them out easily. No truth to the rumor that the, the loggers couldn't find parking and left in discouragement. But by the 1890s, the roads had improved, logging techniques had improved, and the canyon was under threat. At that time, it was the, owned by the um, North Coast uh, Water Company, I believe. But they were looking to sell. Tamalpais Land and Water Company was the name. And they were looking to sell to the highest bidder. And they had hired a bank to, to kind of uh, start to take bids to see how, what, what they could get for the, the canyon. So local conservationists were very concerned. And they were actually not upset when the first group expressed interest and took out an option to buy a portion of the woods. And that group was the Bohemian Club. Now they kind of haven't been in the news for a while because there's been more outrageous stuff going on in Washington. But um, if you haven't heard of the Bohemian Club, it started out in the 19th century as a kind of uh, artists and poets and authors and it quickly devolved into just the opposite. The saying here on the plaque, spiders, weaving spiders come not here. Weaving spiders are women. Now that gives you a little bit of the uh, taste of the Bohemian Club. Here's a, a picture from a few decades ago I, of a uh, Bohemian Club meeting. I don't remember who the man in the, standing up in the center is, but I recognize the two famous Californians sitting on either side of him or infamous, depending on your point of view. Anyway, they took out an option on portions, a portion of Redwood Canyon, and they were going to try it out. They were going to hold their 1892 summer hijinks festival in Redwood Canyon. So in they came. First thing they did was build a giant 43 foot tall plaster Buddha. Now some reports say 70 feet. I don't know. It was gross. So they built the Buddha. They did some drinking. They jumped up onto Buddha's lap and did some very bad poetry. They did some more drinking. They did some off key singing, some more drinking and probably some ribald skits. I mean, how plastered do you have to be to do this? And then they went to sleep under the redwoods. Well, this was summer and the fog rolled in. And the next morning, one of the directors commented, it had been cold enough to freeze the balls off a brass monkey. And I should explain that. Brass, brass monkey was the device that was used by the Royal Navy to store their cannonballs. And when the Royal Navy ships went up into Arctic waters, the metal contracted and the cannonballs rolled off. So we don't have to bleep that one out, Jesse. So uh, the Bohemian Club decided Redwood Canyon wasn't for them. They moved on to warmer climes in Sonoma where they are until this day. But that's how Bohemian Grove got its name, All right? Right here for the Bohemian Club, that's where they camped and that's where that giant Buddha was. Well, things were looking grim though, just as it looked like the logger's ax was to, to be the fate of, of Redwood Canyon, up stepped, up stepped a, a more likable hero. It's this man, William Kent. The Kents were a wealthy family from Chicago. 
they had made their money in the meatpacking industry. And the patriarch of the family, Albert Kent, moved the family out to, to Marin County. Kentfield was the, the family homestead. William Kent, the son, stayed behind for a while. He was a politician. He was an alderman, a corruption fighting alderman in Cook County. And everyone from Chicago always laughs and they claim that that's an oxymoron. But he was doing his best, but he could see that his job back in Chicago would never be finished. So Kent came out to California to join his family. And Kent took one look at Mount Tamalpais and decided that would be a great park place for a national park. Kent was a follower of, Muir, of John Muir. He had read Muir's works and was very influenced by John Muir. So he started to use the Kent family fortune to buy land on Mount Tamalpais that he thought ought to be saved for a national park to be formed someday. So he was the logical one to step forward when it came time to save Redwood Canyon. The problem was by that time, Kent had already spent most of the family family's cash, ready cash. So they were cash poor and land rich at a time when Marin County real estate wasn't worth much. And yes, there was a time, I guess. Well, the Kents had seven children, so William figured he better talk this over with his wife, his wife, Elizabeth Thackeray, uh, Thackeray Kent. And they had a long discussion and William looked at Elizabeth and said, well, if we lost all of our money, but we saved those trees, wouldn't it still be worth it? And she agreed. So they mortgaged their home, they borrowed money from friends, and they came up with $45,000, which unfortunately was about half of what a lumber company was offering. So now it was time for a heroine to step forward. Laura Lyon White. Laura White was involved with several organizations in San Francisco and Marin. One was City Beautiful, another was an outdoor art club, and they were kind of early day Greenbelt Alliance organizations. She wanted to preserve, or they wanted to preserve natural areas in the city and surrounding lands as, as Greenbelts. And just as important, her husband happened to be a gentleman named Lovell White, who was the president of the bank handling the land, the sale of the woods. Well, Laura and Lovell had had a, a son who was the apple of Lovell's eye, but that son died and Lovell was devastated. He desperately wanted to have an heir. He wanted to uh, try to have another child with Laura. Well, she was actually beyond comfortable childbearing age, safe childbearing age for, the, for that time, but she agreed to try. But in return, she extracted a promise that Lovell had to support her in her conservation efforts. Well, they did have the son that uh, Lovell so wanted. And now it came time for Laura to make sure that he made good on that promise. So she went into Lovell and she said, you know, this guy, William Kent, he's not the high bid, but he wants to buy Redwood Canyon and he wants to use it for a public purpose, for a public good, and I want you to sell it to him. And Lovell did, much to the consternation of the, um, the lumber company. And Redwood Canyon and what was to become Muir Woods was saved. This was 1905. And then came the 1906 earthquake and fire. None of the trees fell down, none of the trees burned, but San Francisco burned and a local water company went to court, to take Redwood Canyon away from Kent by the power of eminent domain. They were gonna log all of the Redwoods using to rebuild the Bay Area. And they were gonna build a dam and flood the canyon for a water supply. And Kent couldn't stop them. He'd be compensated under the government power of eminent domain. He'd receive money for the taking, but he didn't want the money, he wanted the trees. And he was kind of at a loss of what to do. So he wrote everybody that he knew in Washington asking for help. One person that he knew was Gifford Pinchot. He was the first head of the Forest Service 
They'd gone to Yale together. And Gifford Pinchot told Kent about a new law that had just been uh, passed called the Antiquities Act. That let the president of the United States set aside land of unique scientific value by proclamation, by his signature alone. Didn't have to go through Congress, which took a long time. And there was mounting opposition to, in Congress to President Roosevelt's conservation goals. So Kent hurried up and he drew up the paperwork and sent it off to President Roosevelt with a letter explaining what was happening and said, please accept this as a gift to the people of the United States and please sign it as soon as you can because I'm about to lose the land. Well, Roosevelt thought it was a great idea. He thought it was a bully idea. And he said, I've got a, a great name for the park we'll, we'll create. We'll call it Kent Woods. And President Roosevelt and uh, William Kent said, oh no, Mr. President, I've got five sons. I expect them to carry on the Kent family name by all their good civic deeds. If they don't do those good deeds, well, the name Kent might as well be forgotten. I'd prefer that you name the new park after John Muir because he's been my inspiration and I know he's been an inspiration to you. So on January 1908, President Roosevelt signed the proclamation creating Muir Woods. And it was even President Roosevelt was going out on a limb. This was the first national monument created to protect a living thing before he had used that to protect uh, archaeological sites in the Southwest and geological sites. Uh, Grand Canyon was originally a national monument before it was a national park. And it was the first national monument that had been created by a donation from a private individual. So they were breaking new ground there, but uh, President Roosevelt was always, Freddie Roosevelt was always up for a fight and they persevered. And you know, the interesting thing is, I don't think there's any definitive evidence that John Muir had ever visited Redwood Canyon before then. But he did come after President Roosevelt established the National Monument, came to, to visit the woods and to, to meet the Kents. And he was uh, duly impressed. John Muir said, well, I've got a, a mountain named after me in the Sierra Nevada. I've got a glacier named after me in Alaska, but no one's ever done anything like this before. Muir Woods is the best tree lovers monument that could possibly be found in all the forests of the world. Well, just how would you have gotten though to, to home stretch here to Muir Woods back in the day, the first couple of decades in the night in the, of the 20th century, it wasn't all that easy. I mean, it's difficult now. What would you have done before the road? Well, as everybody in uh, Marin County knows, there was a railroad built in the 1890s to the top of Mount Tamalpais. It left from Mill Valley, a great tourist attraction. You'd come over in the ferry from San Francisco and you get your ticket and board the train in Mill Valley and you'd chug your way up to the summit was known as the crookedest railroad in the world. 281 curves, count them. And you can actually hike on that uh, railroad bed today in many places. The incentive once you got to the top was the great view. And there was a tavern at the top, which probably helped. So you could fortify yourself uh, with a few drinks when you, when you got there. So a spur line of track was built down to Muir Woods so after that, you could take the crookedest railroad up to the top of Mount Tamalpais, stop off at the beer for, stop off at the tavern for one or two or possibly three beers for what was coming next. You'd buy your ticket and then you would board the gravity cars. You notice there's no engine there. You'd board the gravity cars and you would take the longest roller coaster ride in the world down to Muir Woods. I mean, they weren't going that fast. That, that's the gravity man, he had the handbrake. So that was 
That must have been fun. And there's still a few places where you can see the old gravity car grate on Mount Tamalpais. And there is one of the old gravity cars. This was uh, the survivors of one of our, our, our Green Belt Alliance outings down in downtown Mill Valley. Well, William Kent went on to be a congressman. In 1916, he created the legislation, um, he co-authored the legislation creating the National Park Service. And then he died in 1928 and it was finally possible to name something after him in the park, something he wouldn't permit when he was alive. And the thing that was chosen, was cho it was his favorite tree. That's where the monument would go. And you can visit that today. It's on the Fern Creek Trail, just a little bit up, uh, uh, Kent Monument. And the tree that was chosen to place the monument at, at the base of was a great choice because for many years, it was the tallest tree in Muir Woods. It was 280 feet tall. 20 feet taller than the tallest present tree. It was Kent's favorite tree. And when, John, and when John Muir came to visit, he fell in love with the tree too. It was his favorite tree. Well, the tree came crashing down in 2003. Nobody got squashed. It was long past closing hour. It was late at night. But that tree coming down, the noise it made was heard well outside the park. So if nothing else, it finally answered that age old question. If a tree falls in the forest and there's nobody around, does it make a noise? This one did. But you can still go and visit the monument today, the plaque, and you can see the tree. And if you go up there, take a close look at the tree. I noticed something unusual. The favorite tree of William Kent the favorite tree of John Muir, and for lo those many years, the tallest tree in Muir Woods, now lying horizontal, it's not a coast redwood, it's a Douglas fir. Look, we made it, Jesse. Awesome, thanks, Ken. What a great presentation. Um, I just wanna remind folks that um, we are going to take questions now, if you could use the chat feature or the Q&A function, that would be great. Um, so we did have some questions during your presentation, Ken. Uh, while you were playing the bird sounds, um, we had some audio issues. So if you could repeat the part about insects where the wren finds insects, oh, that would be helpful for folks. Yeah, well, which wren? You didn't get to hear the owl either, huh? We heard them, we couldn't hear oh. you. <laughs> oh, so, um, the winter wren, it's an insectivore, it eats insects. So the question is why in the world would it be attracted to Muir Woods where there's few insects? You don't have to worry about mosquitoes because the, with the trees with the tannic acid, the insects aren't there in the first place. What the winter wrens are there for, the fish come up to spawn of the, the Pacific wrens and they're mostly there late winter and spring. What they're for is the if when the fish die, the coho salmon, the flies come in to eat them. And the Pacific wrens are there to eat the flies. And then what's left of the flies decay and the nitrogen gets returned from, to the soil and the redwoods get that. So those are the interrelated communities. The circle of life. <laughs> uh, okay, and then let's see. We have some questions rolling in here. I'm losing track. Um, Daniela asked, what was the main use for the logged redwood? Oh, lumber. You don't, don't even have to treat it. I mean, it never decays. We've got trees lying on the bottom of Muir Woods that have been there for hundreds of years. So insects don't bother it. It doesn't decay. You don't have to treat it. And it's fire resistant. Yeah. And Chance asked, Given that Muir Woods hasn't had a fire in such a long time, has the National Park Service ever considered controlled burns? Yes. Okay. There have been burns. Uh, they haven't been on the valley floor. There have been a few uh, higher up on the hillsides, but it's just I, I don't think it's practical it's to, to do one now in, in the woods. In 1929, there was a huge, the last really huge fire. Um, it, it, mill, the, the 
on Mount Tamalpais, it burned down and almost destroyed all of Mill Valley. That's what did in the that crookedest railroad in the um, in the roller coaster. But um, that burned a little bit down. There used to be a trail. Those of you that go, hike Muir Woods regularly you know the Ocean View Trail has been changed. The name has changed because. You could see the ocean in 1929 after the fire, but you can't see it anymore. And people would hike up that trail and become irate that it had no view and it was called the Ocean View Trail. But uh, the short answer there is, yes, they considered it. It needs a, a, a control burn, but it's just too risky down there on the forest floor at this point. Um. Carol asked, where does the redwood for decks and lawn furniture come from? Those come from, they'll still come from logging company lands. So they can still log. And redwood grows, quick, grows quickly. It can, they stump sprout and then they'll grow a few feet a year. So all, we'd have many Greenbelt Alliance outings in, in Redwood Regional Park in Oakland. That was the first forest to go because that was easiest to get to and to get the logs out. That was completely logged during the 1850s and 60s. And it was ready for re-logging after the uh, earthquake in 1906 and they logged it again. So those trees that we see on our outings at Redwood Regional Park, those are the grandchildren of the original trees. But it takes, it takes centuries to get an old growth redwood forest to those, all those characteristics, but you can have a redwood tree farm in, in uh, just a few decades and it, it will rejuvenate. Um, Pat asked, is the Dawn Redwood a true redwood? Yep. You know, they're all, they're part of that, um, they're, they're in the Cypress family. They're, they're, they're in the same family. They're not, the three trees aren't even the same genus, so they're not that close. And let's see if I, Metasequoia glossopterus, I think is the name. And the weird thing about that Dawn Redwood, it's deciduous. It drops its sprays every fall and gets them back again. I don't know of another conifer that does that. And when I worked in Muir Woods, every fall we get uh, really people calling up, being really upset they were supposed to be watering their neighbor's yard when they were on vacation, but the redwood appeared to be dying. And usually after a few questions, I could get out of them. It was a dawn redwood, there was nothing to worry about. But yeah. And apparently it has very long life too. It's one of those things with indeterminate life. Um, Mary Jo asked, do you try to grow seedlings in a greenhouse and plant them in the woods for the future? And Greenbelt Alliance does not do that, um, but Ken, you could probably make some suggestions of people who. Yeah, they don't do that at the park because they're concerned about um, the genetic diversity. They want the original trees. I mean, you got a big enough problem. You don't want to be cloning yourself. That's not a good survival strategy. The Redwoods have gotten away with it because they're that's what seems to bother them. But they don't grow redwoods in that, um, in the native plant nursery. In fact, there was a thought that some of the redwoods around the visitor center, around the, the store there, may, it might have been planted at some point. And, it, and one of my, my past boss, Mia Monroe, when she was park supervisor, she was floating the idea they could figure out that they were actually it's a Mia Monroe baseball card. I had one too, but it took like six of me to get one Mia. She was floating the idea if those, if those had been planted, they ought to be chopped down because those weren't the original genetics. So no, they, you can grow redwoods and they're, they're, you know, if, you, if you water them, as long as you're not in a freezing climate, they'll do okay. But they don't do that at Muir Woods. They're real, um, they just want the original trees, with the original genetics. Um, M asked, are there current threats to Muir Woods and what are they? For example, tourists, pollution, fire, et cetera. Yeah, tourists are the main, it's just being overused. And I, the, the program's long enough, I did have a little section, what's going on in Muir Woods? Originally you can wander any place you wanted to. And you, with that shallow root crown, the redwoods you know, were going crazy with the stump sprouting. Then the next stage was to put in trails, but they were asphalt which is only marginally better. That's compacting the ground too. And what's being done now 
to help rejuvenate the woods, boardwalks, elevated boardwalks just a few inches above uh, ground level. But that allows, that keeps the roots from being compressed. That allows water to soak in slowly and to run into the creeks. So that's the ultimate goal there. And poor Muir Woods, it got pretty well beat up because people were going in there before Kent took over and they were kind of stealing some of the vegetation, the ferns and the flowers. And Kent took over and he, Kent is, when he was in Congress, he was kind of a, he was kind of a modern, he was kind of a, a early 20th century version of Bernie Sanders. People speak of his socialist writings, but the one place where he wasn't, when he took over, he got so angry at the people that would go in there and steal the vegetation. He started pontificating about uh, the rights of a lo the Lord of the Manor and how he could string them up like in the old, he wished he could string them up like in England in the old days. <laughs> okay, uh, Bertie asked, is the gravity train operational in some sections and is there still an open cafe or eatery at the top? Uh, it looks like a great historical and fun outing. No, what they have up on the top, there's a nice visitor center and there's a barn with the, the, other, the other gravity car that they bring out on some tracks there. But the original um, tavern on top of Tamalpais is gone. I think all they got now is there's a, uh, there's a soft drink machine on top there. At least there's no McDonald's yet. Um, okay, and then I'm just gonna take one more question here um, since we're, we're over time. Uh, from Peter, with climate change, some are planting redwoods in the Pacific Northwest. Any thoughts on that, Ken? Thinking is range will migrate north and we can assist in this. That was one of the, ideas with um, temperature change so what, that uh, they would head, redwoods could head north. Um, the other side of the coin is with climate change, what happens if the fog is gone in the summer? And then they're in real trouble. But that was one of, redwoods, they've survived all, all these, I mean, there's a, a forest that was planted uh, on Vancouver Island. It's doing okay with the rain and the lack of freezing temperatures. A forest was planted in New Zealand is doing fine with that climate. They're just not gonna make it on their own. And one of the thoughts was they could be moving north, but of course that would, and we'll just have to wait and see. We know that during the last ice age that ended 10,000 years ago, redwoods were growing in the Santa Monica mountains outside Los Angeles. There's redwood, post-redwood pollen in some of the clay. And when it became, when the ice age ended, they retreated to where they are. If we um, lose the fog, well, they're not gonna go extinct, but they could become exclusively a riparian tree living by the creeks and just wait for, try to wait us out, wait for better times. But yeah, it's, uh, they, could, they could move north. Okay. Um, all right, well, that is going to include uh, conclude our Q&A session for this outing. Um, for those of you who missed it at the beginning, uh, I did mention that we, um, or maybe I didn't this time, sorry, <laughs> I need another cup of coffee. We did record this outing and we will be sending it out in a follow-up email to everyone who registered. So check your inbox for that later today. And if for some reason you don't see it in your inbox, um, you can also find it on our website um, under events and outings and then past events. We'll put the recording up there as well. Um, and then as Ken mentioned earlier, we hope you will join us for our next virtual outing, which is botanizing San Francisco's urban staircases uh, that's happening on May 8th. Um, and you can get more information about this outing and others on our website at greenbelt.org forward slash events. And I'd just like to thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Ken, for yet again, a wonderful presentation. Um, and we hope to see you all soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jesse, for facilitating everything and making everything work. Thank <laughs> My you. pleasure. Take care.